Health by Af um, um, Dr. Laila Africa. These are brothers and sisters who have understood um, long ago, long before it was popular, uh, the importance of consuming a more plant-based diet. Even though they didn't call it veganism, you know, I just saw um, Queen Afua speak a couple of weeks ago here in San Diego, and, she, you know, she's been vegan for over 40 years. But we identify now as vegan, she has been for 40 years, before it was a trendy pop term. Right. She raised all of her children who are all grown. I think her youngest child is 36 vegan their whole lives. Right. So there was an understanding uh, among certain groups of Africans about the necessity to stay away from consuming meat, especially as Africans in this country with what Namdi talked about as capitalists, the method of uh, the production of meat and dairy in this country, which is toxic in general and typically targets the most toxic toxic is targeting African and poor communities. One. Two, white people use veganism as a way to make them seem, themselves seem progressive even as they step over the dead bodies of indigenous people and African people and black people and co-sign all wars, but they're super progressive because they don't eat meat and they don't consume dairy, you see. So they use uh, they use this, quote, badge of veganism as a way to bludgeon poor people over the head, right, uh, and criticize poor people uh, as some kind of tyrants for consuming animal products, right, uh, without condemning capitalism, without condemning what capitalism does to poor and working class, black, brown, and red people throughout this country. So most, some of the most reactionary white nationalists I have ever met have been white vegans. Yeah, I think one thing that he mentioned was just the dynamic that under capitalism, you can have access to vegan products. Whether, now, whether those vegan products are also overprocessed themselves, which is a whole nother uh, discussion, <laughs> right? But the fact is, is that... Um, like we were talking to somebody again, just example. We live in a tropical in a in a in an area that's that gets cold in the winter. Most vegans couldn't tell you what they could eat naturally from this region, out of the ground, if it wasn't for the fact that markets can provide fruits and vegetables and all kind of other vegetarian products that don't grow in this region. It's a, it's a consequence of capitalist production that can draw resources and foods, not only from this country, but from other countries to make sure that you can maintain a vegan diet without you having to commit to a real vegan lifestyle uh, locally. Right, right. Which I, I agree with. I'm sorry, no, go ahead, says, I'm sorry. Um, no, I was gonna say, yeah, the question of um, capitalist production, uh, you know, affording us these extraordinary luxuries of being able to eat mangoes 365 days a year, bananas 365 days a year, regardless of where we live, is just another example of how, because we're talking about two different things as far as I'm concerned here. We're talking about, um, we're talking about imperialists or people who, you know, live, uh, I'm talking about white folks. We talk about white vegans and then we're talking about black vegans, right? And so we're talking about two different things here. When we and um, and with white vegans, we're still talking about imperialism, imperialist behavior, and ideas that um, benefit them typically at the expense of everybody else. So when you're talking about being able to consume foods all year round that are not in season and are not local, that's a part of that question. White people in general being able to benefit at the expense of of the immiseration of someone else. Right. Yes. Because when they're eating tropical fruits, when they're eating pineapples and mangoes and bananas and carrying on, they, that is the blood, sweat and tears of some black, brown or red person somewhere else that they do not have to see. So they don't have to feel guilty about the fact that they can live this, you know, this uh, affluent lifestyle, you know, at, at basically as a consequence of um, what we know are still the dynamics of capitalist production. It still requires you know, a base of people who are not getting paid the value of their labor to benefit those who own and control the means of production. 
Indeed. It, it actually walked into my second question and one of the things I brought up at the Vegan Soul Fest where, you know, people, you know, would say, hey, are you vegan? And I would say probably not or I don't know how to. And I explained to them that, well, I haven't supported any migrant workers lately. I haven't put money in the coffer for people who are picking the fruits and vegetables to make sure that these foods that you guys are selling or vending as your product to be able to make independent sales, whether you're an entrepreneur or someone who's just with a co-op, a worker co-op. I can't say honestly that I, I'm a full vegan by switching my diet, but not standing in solidarity and supporting them, which comes in my next question is, is it necessary to support and stand in solidarity with farm laborers, unions, and migrant workers for the conditions they face with farming and picking fruits and vegetables so that we all eat? Sort of what you were, you know, mainly touching on before I asked this question as well, but just to, you know, to revisit it specifically to, to refine it as well. Yeah, I think it's the question. It's not yes. an important question. It is the question. And it's so funny that you mention it because um, I've been on the road now about a month and a, actually about two months now. And part of my travels was to make a point of going to Native American reservations. So, so far I've been to four reservations. I've stayed on them, camped on these reservations. And before having done this, my understanding, like, you know, Nandi can tell you, we, uh, you know, fortunately came up in an organization that was serious about the question of solidarity work, especially among indigenous people, uh, Mexicans and Native Americans. It, but even within the context of that organization, I always found our, quote, solidarity work somewhat frustrating because it just seemed very um, superficial. It, it, it didn't seem to go really deep. You know, we'll come to your demonstration or we'll support this campaign, but it didn't seem like an ongoing, real, organic, and I haven't witnessed that yet, not to say that it's not out there, I just haven't witnessed it yet, an organic uh, mechanism of true solidarity among black, brown, and red people in this country. And so it became more of an issue for me, even as I continue to do the work outside of this this organization. So I stayed on the res. Everything that I understood about Native Americans, Native American life, the reservation, res life was conjecture because I didn't know a single African personally that had ever spent any time on the reservation, didn't know any Native Americans personally. You understand what I'm saying? So everything we understood about them was conjecture. And it was, it was a game changer, man. When I tell you it was a game changer for me, to spend a week, to spend nine days on two different reservations in the desert, to hear uh, indigenous men and women talk about the circumstances with which they are forced to live in this country, to meet Mexicans here in California, revolutionary Mexicans, who we just don't have a deep understanding yet of what solidarity work is supposed to look like. So when you're talking about veganism and how it's, just what I said, it separates itself from the suffering of people who have to produce w uh, without being paid the value of their labor so that uh, people over here can have this very cushy, you know, trendy pop culture type uh, lifestyle that they can shine as their badge of how progressive they are, right? And, um, and solidarity work to me, um, especially as Africans, I will say this, because it's tied to this discussion. My position now is that as Africans, every struggle that we make about our mistreatment in this country, about our history in this country, about our shortened life expectancy, about you know, the, you know, our contact with the police and what that means a, a great number of times, um, about anything that we can complain about, legitimately have a complaint about in our relationship to the United States, we cannot make a single struggle as Africans legitimately and expect people to come on board with our aspirations for freedom and independence without prefacing our concerns with, I want to stand in solidarity with the struggles of indigenous people to have their damn land back because whatever we suffer, they suffer 10 times more. That is a statistical fact. 
That is what solidarity is. We cannot, we can't make a demand for ourselves for freedom, independence, a right to control our own lives, sovereignty to control our own land, while we still stand on the lands, on the mountain high bones of red people who still suffer light years more than we do. If black men have a shorter life expectancy than white men, Native Americans have a 20 year less ex life expectancy than black men in this country. They're 10 times more likely to die when they come into contact with the police. You know, their women are being rounded up for the human trafficking industry in this country. So that's my long version of saying that what you're talking about in terms of uh, how we tend to, we're so myopic, you know, we're so narrow in our vision and in our thinking. But black and brown people to be calling themselves vegans without raising the struggles of migrant workers, without raising the struggles of indigenous people, Mexicans and otherwise, to have full rights over their lives, over their lands, is a problem to me and it's not genuine. So that's my long statement about that. Carl Renabdi, you want to respond on that? That was, yeah, that, that was well delivered and well served. 